Okay. Leia has installed a state-of-the-art computer program to help players practice focus and relaxation. Okay, so I want you now to get your concentration as deep as you possibly can, which means that the lower this line is, the deeper your concentration and focus. So the more it's jumping up, the more your focus is dispersed. So just visualize playing a point. About a 10 second point. Visualize you're hitting the ball. Really intensely focused on that ball. Great work, great work. And now the point's over and I relax. As Kara relaxes her concentration, the lines on the screen change pattern. As soon as the point is over, they go through kind of a positive physical response, as if to say, even if they've made a mistake, they don't really show it. They have this very strong look of confidence, a, se a sense of, I can handle this, I'm okay, I'm moving forward. You can see it by the way they carry their head and their racket and their shoulders the instant the point is over. go wherever it wants to go, just kind of discharge. Then they move into what we call a kind of a recovery, kind of a relaxation phase. This is the longest period. It may last anywhere from six to maybe 10 seconds. But here they go through a deep breathing and they allow their brain to kind of go, to kind of do this micro break. They just kind of go away, but not too far. They just get peaceful inside. They allow the attention to kind of go on idling a little bit. And then, then they start moving up to the line to serve or return serve, and they go through what we call a preparation period, where they start to think about the next point just for a few seconds. What should I do here? If my coach were to give me the best suggestion, what would it be? And then the final thing is kind of what we call the ritual stage, where they just kind of go into bouncing the ball, and they go on automatic pilot. Whatever is programmed now is like going to be launched, and they play purely by instinct. And those four sequences are extremely valuable in, in and of themselves, but it's really important they're all synchronized together and it becomes part of the person's personality. And you don't get more personality than this man. <laughs> John McEnroe was famous for his outbursts of temper when things weren't going his way. But Lair thinks his anger served a particular purpose. John McEnroe obviously was a brilliant player and he learned to manage nerves in a very particular way. John eventually learned that, just like everyone, that when he was tight and nervous, he didn't play well. And he found that when he got angry, the nerves went away. And he much preferred to play angry than he did nervous. Lair believes that McEnroe instinctively used ritual to bring his game under control. And what does McEnroe think? Sometimes I step on a line, sometimes I don't step on a line, just depending on what, what I'm feeling. And sometimes I'll bounce a ball a certain amount of times, other times I didn't. So it's, it's, if, if I do something and it works, I sort of stick with it till it doesn't work, and then I try something else. And if you'll notice, John, when he got angry, he took a lot of time between points. He became the most ritualized player in the game. He had very precise rituals for serving and return of serve. And when he would do this walking back and forth, you would begin to see that chemistry start to change. So it's an interesting thing. That was the way John adapted to the forces of tennis. We don't recommend it because most go up and smoke if they follow his path. Plotting the career path of these young professionals, nothing is left to chance. To master the power game, their lives are dominated by ritual and routine. In part four, we look at whether the changes that science has brought to the game will have a lasting effect on the spirit of tennis. 
Tennis is a hugely popular game. It's played by an estimated 60 million people worldwide. But while there have never been so many professionals playing, the number of people watching has been steadily falling. So is tennis in trouble? Some think tennis lost its way with the advent of the power game. Others blamed the explosion of new money for killing the fun. The money has changed the sport. It really is, up to recently, boarding on the ridiculous. I mean, tennis audiences were, were going down and the prize money was going through the roof. The bad thing for me is that the attitude of the players was not to go out there and win and play for your country and try and be the best you can be, but it is to make money. Serious money made for a serious game, and the men's events came in for particular criticism. Fans were nostalgic for the exhilarating rallies, great rivalries, and the light-hearted moments recalled at the Honda Challenge by players like Henri Leconte, John McEnroe, Boris Becker, and of course, Mansour Barami. They all want to become number one, and you know, by doing that, they have no time to think about the crowd and to give a good show or, or a joke with the ball boy or, you know. You had charismatic players like, you know, Connors, McEnroe, Nastasi, Noah, Borg. When they were playing, there was always something going on in the court. But the cry of boring tennis was also a reaction to the way the men's powerful super serve had begun to dominate the game. In 2001, Croatia's Goran Ivanisevic served 800 aces with this formidable weapon. The big serve is a product of the racket revolution and the bigger, stronger physique of today's players. Paul Rotert explains how a player can achieve power. What players do when they're serving, they use their leg musculature and as they're bending down when, when they're hitting and then bring the body back up, they're extending the knees and they're producing power pushing against the ground. That power is then transferred throughout the hips that open up, then the upper body rotates and then finally the arm swings out. Greg Rosetsky holds the world record for the fastest serve. A tornado force 149 miles, that's nearly 200 kilometers per hour. One thing Rosetsky and other big servers have in common is their height. Rosetsky and Ivanisevic are both six foot four. Todd Martin is six foot six. They would have towered over former champions like Rod Laver, Jimmy Connors and Bjorn Borg, who were all under six feet. The super serve gives an opponent as little as an incredible 0.3 of a second to react. The International Tennis Federation was worried the increasing speed of the game might outstrip human ability. They attempted to reverse the way technology had speeded up the game by using science to slow it down. They recently introduced a larger tennis ball for fast grass courts. Peter Maxton says it's nothing new. The larger tennis ball w was introduced uh, back in the 1970s originally and then, then has been reintroduced as a, as a means of slowing the game, game down. But why does a larger ball make a difference? Howard Brody explains. This ball, because it is 6% larger, has 12% more air resistance. When it flies through the air, it slows down 12% more than this ball will. So will it catch on? I don't think that it's going to be readily adopted by, by most tournaments. Most players are very happy with the ball. and it, You'd have to have a universal change. You'd have to have every tournament in the world adopting the larger tennis ball. But even as efforts are made to curb the super serve, there are signs of a reviving interest in the game. Spectators are being lured back by a new wave of players with distinctive personalities and styles. And women's tennis, once tagged boring, has only benefited from more powerful rackets. It's now seen as a great spectator sport and television coverage is soaring. The women's game has benefited because it appears on TV and the women are hitting the ball as hard and, and, and certainly they are hitting it harder. I think people um, enjoy the women's game more because of it, so it's been a, been a positive. But 
The fact that they've had some interesting stories and personalities is probably the biggest reason. The fact that people latch on to personality and see rivalries is something that in any sport is, is, is uh, the number one thing in, in my opinion. There's no doubt that the revolution of the wide-bodied racket has changed the game of tennis forever. With the help of biomechanics, better nutrition, and psychology, players are gradually learning to cope with the new game. And now there's an optimism they'll turn tennis into an art form of their own.